Welcome to the Business Vitality Podcast. My name is Katherine Canty. I am the host and an executive coach. I work with teams, individuals, and leaders to help create measured leadership change. We do that using practical applications, and our clients are creating 100% measured results as seen by those around them. Not necessarily what I think or what they think, but what the other people are seeing. And they are being recognized for the hard work that they're doing. If you're interested in learning more about some of the work that we're doing, you can learn more at KatherineCanty.com. I would love for you to subscribe to this show, to Business Vitality. This is my way to continue to pay it forward and share business best practices. Stay tuned and listen to the interview. Thanks for being here. Tiffany Bova, you are the global growth and innovation evangelist of Salesforce found on the web at TiffanyBova.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me today. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. I have admired your work for a long time. So this is a treat for me to be able to connect with you and just be able to have this conversation. Um, I was first introduced to you or by your book that you have out, Growth IQ, which is, I think, just the most impressive book of just case studies and successes and failures and best practices, everything that people need, um, just if you're in the business world and you need some good case studies. So um, I'm excited to be able to kind of talk to you more about your work, which you um, include in this book, which is phenomenal. And before we get into it, can you kind of tell us at a high level, what exactly is an innovation evangelist with Salesforce? That is a great uh, title. Yeah. So I get more comments, trust me, on the title than almost anything. Uh, you know, prior to joining Salesforce, I've been here five and a half years now. I was a a distinguished analyst and research fellow at Gartner for a decade covering sales transformation and go-to-market models, uh, indirect channel strategies, and really working with some of the largest tech companies in the world on how to improve growth uh, at a high level. Um, And so Salesforce asked me, you know, hey, would you come on board and continue doing what you're doing, but do it for us and do it for our clients? And uh, that's what uh, I was able to do. And so it had to be a title that sort of shared that, you know, I'm kind of out there telling the stories of some of our trailblazers and some of the best practices of what we're seeing across uh, industries and across sectors and size organizations. And so evangelist is the easiest way to do that. And growth and innovation are the two areas that I pay the most attention to. So that kind of is the short story of how it happened. I love it. Thank you. You know, that's not an everyday title. And as someone who's been in banking for a couple of decades before I went out on my own, we only know the VP, the the AVP, the VP and SVP. So a unique uh, job title like that is kind of fun to play with. So thanks for sharing that. Um, well, I, asked, one, I, 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 yeah, actually ha- I, I actually have one of those. I just don't use you it. Do? Yeah, well, it's because, not as fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also because I think that um, it also might signal that I have a team and people report to me and I have PL responsibilities and and I don't. So, you know, I tried to keep that out so people didn't make assumptions of sort of what I did. Yeah. So you're an independent contributor. Is that correct? I am. I am. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, freedom that comes with that. And I was talking with a lady earlier today about just the team dynamics and the people aspect. And um, she kind of joked, it sure would be a lot easier if I didn't have all the people to have to worry about day in and day out. So um, yeah, an independent contributor can can definitely have its pluses on some of those days. Um, so you, you've, um, You've been told in the past that your operational research experience has allowed you to provide a lot of these insights um, and has allowed you allowed you to be one of the leading thinkers in the area of sales transformation and business model innov- innovation. Um, as your current conversations center around one main objective and your main objective that seems to be popping back up is customer success. Um, do you have a particular success story or lesson learned that you can share with us in regards to customer success? Sure. You know, it was interesting because coming into Salesforce, we used to talk about, you know, customer service and what that sort of experience might look like. And I started asking the question, uh, is your customer service organization a cost center or is it a revenue generation engine? And just by that simple question, but complex answer, I would get uh, more insights into companies. But what I started to realize when I joined Salesforce was those that really were not viewing customer service as a cost center had transformed the organization into something called customer success organization. 
And it was really how can companies use your product or service in a way to help them be more successful? And so whether, you know, obviously I'm in technology, so the technology for technology's sake is not that interesting, but if we can provide the ability for an organization from, you know, very small one person shop to a, you know, 100,000 employee organization to help them be more successful in selling, engaging and supporting their customers, that is success for us. And that's a different uh, lens to look through, right? Versus just saying, look, our sales are X. <laughs> this is how many customers are using our product, but it's more how many customers have we deployed the technology to, but are using it in a way that is helping them be more successful. And I think that is a distinct difference. And if you hear this and you're listening to this and go, oh my goodness, we have a customer service call center and I'm just going to change the name to customer success. You've missed the point. It isn't about just changing the name. You really have to change the culture the, the way that you look at it, the metrics you put in place, the people you hire, the way you train, you know, what the metrics are to, to manage the business. In that case, then I feel like you've made the cross kind of cross the chasm from customer service to customer success. Yeah. When you enter a call center and I've, I've been fortunate to be in an operations center for over a decade. I've also been on the sales and the customer focus and, and the client side for over a decade. And what I've seen is when you go into a call center and these folks are empowered to be able to have these two-way discussions and be able to resolve the problem and even possibly cross sell and, and begin to you know help the customer even more based off of the training that they were provided to help the customer, it, it definitely sets the organization in a different place as far as business growth and leadership growth and um just sets them off to a whole nother level. And so I love that you share that it doesn't just stop at the front line, but it's also in that customer customer care center. Um, do you see it with the technicians that are out on the road? You know, not just the, the frontline salespeople, but are you seeing a lot of these organizations take it to that next level, like the servicing level and, and beyond that as well? Yeah, it's a great question because I'd say that we definitely have seen that accelerate over the last 18 months, right? And a lot of that was based on the fact that you couldn't just deploy service technicians into the field, let's say the first six months of the pandemic, because it was like, can they enter your home? Should ever somebody be there? Like, what are the rules of engagement? How do we make sure our employees are safe and our customers are safe? And how do we make that happen? And how do we communicate to the field uh, in, in a way that allows them to be obviously capable and successful when they're in a customer's home, let's say, but also the ability for them to then uncover and identify opportunities for them to cross sell or upsell, which might have been something that intuitively they felt like those field technicians were actually doing, but it wasn't something that they were able to do at scale or capture that information. So for example, right, your your tele, uh, television provider or cable provider, right, shows up in your home and has another offering potentially for streaming and then says to you, hey, you know, I see that you're doing all these things on your TV. We've just set this up. Have you ever considered going to streaming? And let's hypothetically say I said yes. What does that technician do with that? Yes. Do they enter it into, you know, a device, right? A tablet. Does it kick off a series of activities from the marketing department to reach back out and say, hey, we'd love to schedule a call or a demonstration with you, or we can send you, you know, because you're a valued customer, you know, $50 off or whatever it might be. Is that the trigger? And so it's sort of two sides, one, allowing them to service better and, and now more than ever in an appointment based way, not like our technician's going to be there on Tuesday just Tuesday, yeah. <laughs> not even what time or <laughs> eight to noon or noon to five, those blocks of time are no longer good enough. And so how do we compress that to provide a better experience uh, for the, for the customer, but also for the employee. And so it's scheduling, you know, getting more intelligent and more communicative in that way, but then also allowing those field technicians to uncover, uh, you know, that opportunity forward it to the appropriate people. We don't need the technicians to necessarily sell and take an order right then and there, but we do need them to capture that and allow it to go through uh, the process that gives the customer a feel like, oh, I shared that with my technician. They followed up. What a great seamless experience I've had with that brand. Yeah. Seamless experience is key. And that follow-up, it just continues to shock me. Sometimes the things that fall between the cracks and the follow-up that doesn't take place and um, just showing up and being consistent just continues to shock me as like, that is what people 
want to see and they're excited to see it. You're thinking, but that's so simple, but yet it's what people really respond to. So um, that seamless transition and being able to hand it off to the next department with, with that trust that they're going to take care of that person, just like you took care of them. So um, I think that's, that's vital. Um, you talk about customer experience a good bit in your book about growth IQ. And, you know, in, in my banking days, we spent a number of, I guess, years talking about the CX experience. And as I was transitioning out, the EX, the employee experience started to come up and you talk about on your website and books, et cetera, our book is, you know, the fastest way to get your customers to love your brand is by ensuring that your employees love their jobs. Um, Do you mind kind of talking about that? And do you have maybe a, a case study or two that you'd like to reference of folks that are doing that well today? Sure. You know, there's, there's lots to be said with that. You know, I started the book off, as you mentioned, it was 10 paths to growth. And the very first path was customer experience, right? Putting the customer uh, at the center of the decisions that you make and making them your true North. What I missed in that chapter though, was talking even, you know, giving it some time uh, on the employee side, like brands and companies are made up of people that that's what a company is. And so that experience that is delivered or received from a customer is either via a human, right? In an interaction, like we were just talking about in the field or with a seller or with a teller behind a bank, you know, a counter, whatever it might be. But it also is experienced with products. Is the user interface intuitive? You know, does it have the ability for someone who ha- is sight impaired or hearing impaired? Does it allow them to, you know, use and engage with your product as well? It has things to do with, you know, actually the the act of buying. Does legal make it really difficult, right? Does actually buying and, you know, do I have to not use this particular credit card? I only can use that particular credit card. And all of that plays a part in experience. But on the other side of that is a human. And so if you have a human who, you know, the employee that's really happy with their job, they develop products that are more integrated, right? More inclusive as an example, right? The FAQs are easy to find and, you know, kept up to date, or, you know, the seller is, uh, you know, has, shows up with all of these insights because of the technology that they're now using, whatever it might be, all of those things play a part. Everybody plays a part in the customer experience. Uh, It's not about what you sell. It's not about how you sell. It's really how customers feel when they engage with your brand on both sides. So, you know, I think that uh, since joining and, you know, Salesforce that I've really started to pick up on that whole theme and concept of the implications that either an engaged and happy workforce or an, an unengaged and unhappy workforce has on the ability for that brand to continue to deliver products and services that people want to use and continue to use and or you know have people delivering um, and providing these experiences at a human level. So I went out to uh, prove the hypothesis and sure enough, we, we did a project with Forbes Insight and we found that uh, those companies that do those things well in harmony have 1.8X faster growth rates. And so for mm-hmm. a billion dollar brand, it's a $40 million impact. So it is significant. And so within that research uh, note, which you can, you can search, uh, it's called the experience equation. Uh, you can search that and the word Salesforce, uh, it should pick right up um, and you can download it. But we actually have a two by two quadrant that shows in the right, right, what companies we think are doing a really great job. Now, it is not an exhaustive list. If you don't see, you know, the brands that you think should be there who deliver these great experiences, it, they're not, not there for a reason. It's just that we used a, a very specific Um, research methodology that kicked up those particular brands. So with that said, you know, you have the normal, right? Herb Kelleher at Southwest, uh, the former chairman and CEO, right? All about the experience or someone like a Richard Branson with Virgin, right? It's all about the experience. Uh, And so even someone like a Jeff Bezos, where it's all about customer experience, right? Customer is number one. You see that across the board where people really lean into saying customer is what we're all about. Uh, But I think what has been missing is that employee angle. So we've just completed a global study to amplify and further dig into this entire concept, which the new research is going to come out in January of 2022. So super excited about sharing that. But, But I'd say that this is where companies really struggle, that if you are a brand or you know, you're know you a manager or a leader or even an entrepreneur, small business owner, and you are, we are customer centric. It's all about the customer. You cannot get there without making sure that your employees have what they need um, in order to serve the customer and do what's you know best and right for the business, 
but also going back to what we were just talking about, that success of the customer using your product or service. So the experience equation that you referenced, is that was that a recent survey that you did since COVID has taken place or was that something that happened before COVID? No, it was during. Uh, we okay. were going to kick it off in sort of January, February of mm -hmm. 20, and then COVID hit. So we stalled a minute to just say, like, do we want to do it right at the beginning of this pandemic, not knowing, obviously, how long it was going to last. Once we got past the sort of six-month mark and things started to settle down uh, from understanding that this isn't going to go away anytime soon, um, we decided to kick it off. So it came out. Uh, I want to say like September timeframe of 2020. Um, okay. And now this one uh, has been fielded pretty much through the last six months. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be, you know, sort of not in the initial phases of it, but because uh, so much has changed in the definition of what is a compelling and meaningful customer experience and what does it mean to have a highly engaged workforce has forever changed because of it. We knew it was the right time to sort of highlight what will the future of those two things look like. So some folks are going to be familiar with the CX experience and the EX may be something that maybe is not as familiar since we've talked about the customer journey and the mapping and, and et cetera, et cetera. If someone is wanting to start to get into the EX, the employee experience, are there three or four questions they can ask within their business to their employees as maybe a part of the HR function to begin to collect some of this information to kind of get a pulse on it before fully jumping into a full on, you know, survey or research? Yeah, it, it's a great question because I think people approach this very differently. You know, I want to be clear, like when you think about employee, it could be, how do you write a job description and how do you recruit and how do you hire? I want to put that aside for a second. This is from you know, when an employee is actually an employee, not sort of mm -hmm. getting into the company. And then also when they don't become an alumni of the organization, we're talking about during the time that they're working. I'm going to give one stat. We did some research with MuleSoft, which is one of the companies we've acquired. And they did some research that found that the average enterprise had 900 apps that were used in the enterprise and only 27% of them are integrated. Now, some of them, you know, like legal and finance, let's say NHR, they're never going to be integrated in a way where everyone's going to have access to it. So put those aside. And let's just say that it, the goal is to have 60% of it integrated, 40% not appropriate to, we have a long way to go. And so as an employee, I'm in a call center, I'm in the field, all the things you just described, and I want to serve a customer and I don't have access to data. One you know, system tells me that you know, Tiffany Bova's address is here. Another system says that the address is here. I'm about to go out to a call, which one, which is the right address, or, you know, I need to refund money. I don't have a credit card on file, whatever it might be that slows the employee down from serving the customer. But it also creates a level of frustration for the employee themselves of where do I go? How do I do this? What's the best way? So I'm just using that one example of employee experience has to do with all kinds of things, right? Career opportunity, training, investment in those things, the systems and tools, the processes you put behind it. What is the metric for their job? Is it, you know, is it a shared metric across the company? Do they have line of sight into how their job plays a role in that particular metric? I mean, it's, a, it's an ocean full of, of options, but to your specific question, I'd say, the kind of rigor you put into understanding, are your customers happy? You need to put that same kind of rigor on are your employees happy? Because once again, if they're not happy, they're not developing products, they're not serving your customers as well as they could. And there's a balance between productivity and understanding what they do on a daily basis and also giving that, that, them that autonomy and power and enablement to do what they think is best, not only for the business, but for the customer. That is a fine balance. So if you're listening to this and you've never thought about the connection of those two, you know, uh, that would be what and how do those two things connect? Is there any leader that has line of sight across those two groups? You know, marketing usually has customer experience and the chief human resource or, or chief people officer tends to have the employee or the human side how are they connected? And if they're not connected, that's where we, we absolutely feel there's a ton of opportunity for improvement. Yeah, there, it could appear to be overwhelming in that example. Yes. If you have 900 apps, okay, first mm -hmm. you have to just ask the question from the employee's perspective, has the experience and get into that detail and whittle it down to the experience, not the job description, but the experience of the day-to-day -day work, and then identify what the opportunities are, and then weed through what has the biggest impact in the shortest period of time. And then it's almost like work begins. So this could be really intimidating to an organization that's just trying 
to survive and thrive, you know, post COVID. And um, I don't even know if, if you just map this out over a 12 month process and know, or is this more like a 36 month process in this example where you're talking about 900 apps and trying to find that common thread to kind of close some of those gaps and, and, and create successes? Is it just a, a roadmap that goes out there that we're all familiar with within corporate of the 36 month roadmap to get us to the end? Or are there smaller things that are more bite-sized that can kind of create some small success to create momentum to create the impact in a, in a more, I guess, time efficient way? Is that possible? So going back to what I said, that sort of rigor you put into customer, how often do you survey your employees? Do you do it annually? If, if right. you're only doing it annually, I'd say that's not enough, especially right now. I'd say monthly would be really great, but I'm not saying a 72 question survey, right? <laughs> it might be a pulse survey on what is it. And so you might see a spike in um, anxiety and burnout. Okay. So what do you do? So yeah. I'm just going to give you Salesforce as an example. We saw that spike uh, sort of June, July of last year. Um, and then they put in place a no meeting Thursdays and a wellness day one Friday a month just to sort of like give everybody a break. Then they changed the, uh, you know, Google calendar to instead of ending at the half hours that it's like, you know, giving you five minutes. So it's never a 30 minute meeting. It's either a 20 or 25 minute meeting to give you just that second, to just sort of prep between meetings, something that simple, but you saw it spike. And then we did some things and you start kind of come back down. And so it is never, there is never an end game. It's not like it's one year long or three year long. As long as you have employees, it should always be going on. And so I think initially it's to understand what are the top three or four or five pain points your employees have. I don't know what the answer to that is, right? Because every, every business is different, but do you even know what that is? And then some of them may be to your point, quick hits, like we can mm -hmm. fix this at like the, you know, no meeting Thursdays and a wellness Friday. That's a very quick hit, right? It, it's simple to do. Um, and then even changing the calendar. Some may be more medium term, could be three to six months. Some may be more longer term, could be a year, a year and a half like that. You know, the integration of the apps, as an example, is probably a multi-year project, but yeah. do you need all those apps? So some of it might be rationalizing, but everything I just described is in different groups, right? The CIO or IT org has app integration, right? The chief people officer may have, you know, that all that scheduling, but has to get with IT to make that happen. You've got somebody in employee communications and running the surveys and doing that. So it's not like it all falls on one person. Now, if you're a really small organization, you may, you may wear multiple hats, hats, all of a sudden this does become overwhelming for you. And so maybe this is a, you know, an opportunity for you to bring in a coach or an advisor or, or a consultant to help you mitigate and, and rationalize where to go sort of first, second, and third. But I would say first ask the questions and cover what those top three, four or five things are. Get those quick hits out of the way immediately. I even had an entrepreneur, she's on um, Dragon's Den, which is Canadian's version of Shark Tank, um, on my podcast. And, and she said, we set up an email called The Stupid Things We Do at, mm -hmm. in her company name. And it, of course, when they first did it, they only had 120 employees, but it was you know loaded with stupid stuff they do. But what was amazing was 80% of those were quick hits. It was just stuff like, wow, we didn't know we made you log in here and log in here. We didn't know that we needed you to do this before that. So some of it was quick process fixes, but you have to be open and willing to number one, ask the question. Then you have to be willing to listen to the answers and really listen and then communicate back out. This is what we heard, you know, good, bad. And, and ugly, right? This is what we heard. This is what we're going to do. We heard this, but this is why we're not going to fix it. This is what we heard. This is why we're going to fix it, how long it's going to take us to fix it. And we'd love to pull an employee into this work group. Please submit your name if you'd like to be part of the team. It has to be this. Everybody is sort of going in the same direction. So that's where I would uh, you know, advise to start for sure. I think it's brilliant. And I love the uh, email address that you just shared. So um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to steal that idea, assuming they have the courage to, uh, to stomach the information. Um, so growth is, is a thinking game. And it's, it's just, you said with the CX and EX, it's never just one thing. And since we have, we've gone through a full year of COVID and, and we're, I don't know where we are now if we're heading out or we're heading into another variant of it, but you know, things are different and we've got to think in a different way. Um, what are some of the ways that you're seeing folks think in a different way towards growth? 
Yeah, when the pandemic first hit, as I mentioned, there were sort of 10 paths to growth. And uh, as you said, the one thing about growth is it's never one thing. So it's never that a company focuses on just one path. It is always a combination of paths. And there's three paths that tend to get used the most. One is customer experience, which we talked a lot about. The next one is optimizing the way you sell, like getting better <laughs> on the way you sell. And the, and, the, and the third one is your customer base penetration, really taking care of those existing customers that you have. And everything else, you know, launching into markets, introducing new products, creating partnerships, the other sort of paths that I have, have to have a strong of those three things, right? You want to make sure you can sell okay. You want to make sure your customers are having a good experience and you want to make sure your existing customer base is taken care of. And with that one, maybe churn if you're in a recurring revenue business, those two sort of in combination. When the pandemic first hit, I was like, look, you have to nail those three and do not forget about your existing customers. And so if you remember in the first 60, 90 days, you started getting all these emails from all these brands you might not have had any interaction with for years. They're like, we care about you. How can we be here to help? You know, whether it's flowers or, you know, an e-commerce site, or you ordered some birthday present from somebody or baby shower years ago. And they're like, we're here for you. <laughs> so I'm not saying that was wrong, but that just shows how out of date the data was that they didn't really know. The message should have been, we know we haven't heard from you in years, mm -hmm. but we, you know, we, what, we're here for you. This is what we're doing in case you're looking for these things. How could you have personalized it and have done it better? And so it was all about the sort of customer. And then obviously uh, so many companies had field sellers that all of a sudden were inside sellers. And how do you make sure right away um, they can get back to uh, meaningful engagement with customers in a virtual world? And now 18 months in, we've started to find the balance between in-person uh, depending on where you're listening to this in the world, right? In person uh, and virtual and when and what, when and why is it digital first and when and why would it be in person first? And so I think we're starting to find our way through. Um, but ultimately the, the thing I'd tell you is that one path, one in, intentional growth effort is really, really risky. You've got to give yourself the ability to have um, more than one, and I'm not saying 10, but two or three, so that if one slows down, right, field selling is overnight inside and you didn't have e-commerce, you were really, really stuck, you know? And so um, being able to think about it differently, and that's why I say growth is a thinking game. If you can outthink the competition, you don't necessarily have to outspend or out hire or out, out uh, innovate, right? If you can outthink, um, you can do even better with what you have at your disposal already. And it sounds like if you have the courage to ask the question, you'll get the information that you need. And you truly do just need to be able to think differently in order to capture it and to implement it. So I think that is a lot of gold in what you said. So thank you. Yeah. And I would say since you're in banking, you know, great, great example would be, you know, when the pandemic first hit, you know, I didn't hear from my bankers at all about, you know, hey, if, you know, what if you happen to lose your job or if you're a small business owner, like here's the things that you can access. Like I, I got no proactive communication, yeah. um, you know, even just if you put that aside, but then even just on a, Hey, you know, we know you're this age. They happen to know when I was born, we know you're probably looking towards retirement. This may have impacted you because the last 18 months have been very different. You know, maybe you'd want to meet with a wealth advisor or you'd want to, you know, nothing. So they have a lot of information about, yeah. you know, all kinds of things that by the way, people are most concerned about paying their bills, paying their mortgage, paying their rent, right? Getting a paycheck, getting access to um, PPP funds, whatever it might be. Um, ultimately, I think it was just a, a, a big miss um, from the financial community over the last 18 months to be much more proactive uh, about communicating with the market. Yeah, I'd even challenge it and say, I don't think it's too late to even come back now and just say, you know, we realize that you've got retirement on your mind or you, we realized, you know, based off of the information that we have on you, that X, Y, Z may have, be of interest to you. And, and uh, I don't think it's too late to reach out and to be able to connect with your clients and your customers to let them know that you're here and you can service them and, and use the data that you do have. Um, that's a great point. So, and also I just, I don't think it's too late. Um, when it comes to work-life integration, do you mind kind of sharing your thoughts on how, I guess, maybe your thoughts or experiences on kind of working through different stresses throughout the different phases of, of a career? Um, I think you had maybe a, a reference of that on your, on your website, and I want to hear a little bit more about it if you're up for it. 
Sure. You, you know, look, my, like all of us, our lives are so drastically different um, than they were 18 months ago. You know, while I have worked from home for 15 years, so working from home was not the disruption for me. What was the disruption for me was in 2019, I flew 275,000 miles. I was on six continents. I gave a hundred keynotes. I was in Sydney for almost three weeks uh, from the end of February to the beginning of March of 2020. I got back in um, to the U.S. two days before uh, the president shut down the border from international flights, especially from uh, the Asia Pacific region. So I just squeaked back in. And so overnight, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I had probably 30 trips, you know, planned and things I was supposed to do, everything stopped. And so for me, it was, wow, you know, I use my flying time to think. I use those events as ways to connect and learn from other people with you know, other points of view, especially because I fly globally. So I get to hear it um, in real time, sort of what is different region to region, whether it's Latin America, ASEAN, ANZ, uh, APAC, uh, EMEA, you know, or uh, North America. And so understanding that and having access to that, all of a sudden for the first six months, I was really lost. Like, I just didn't know, okay, how do I keep this kind of connection um, in my sort of research pool, right, of where I would do my, do my work. Um, so I've had to try to recreate that flying time and lobby time and conversation time in a virtual way. Like, you know, as you can see, I took my garage. It's now a full-blown um, studio. So, you know, doing keynotes here, uh, which just starting to get back on the road again. Um, but ultimately, it, at the beginning, I really started to spend a lot of time. I was hiking, I was walking, I was, you know, trying to get out of the house because I'd not been in my home office for sort of, you know, weeks at a time in a really long time, well over a decade um, that I had, had been home for a full month. I, it had eased, maybe it might even be longer than that. Could have been 20 years that I hadn't been home uh, for a month. Um, so, you know, that for me was to find the balance um, in work when I'm working and living in the same space and I'm not having work take me out of that space. Um, so, you know, I just say that I, I had to reconnect with what it was like to be in my same environment 24-7. Uh, um, but now I, I feel more comfortable. And now what's odd is now I'm kind of like, wow, I have to get back on the road. Like, I don't even know how to pack and repack in 24 hours. Like I had that down to a science, right? Like, can I catch an Uber? Are they still as available? Like get away. All of yeah. a sudden I, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing uh, with travel, which is uh, uh, ironic on so many levels. Um, so I just feel like, you know, being in tune with yourself and understanding, you know, what's working, what's not working, what you miss, uh, you know, what is really stressful for you and trying to find ways um, to get yourself uh, back on track. And a lot of it was having conversations with others that are like me that we used to see on the road all the time, like just get together once a month to just be like, hey, how are you doing? Like, how's it working with this virtual keynoting and advising in this way? And, you know, just feeling like you're not alone in this journey uh, was really, really helpful for me. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, the commute time, is that was just my time for phone calls and connecting with people. And then that goes away. And it's kind of like, Oh, it's not that you don't want to connect, but you're kind of like, Oh, all that time that we had, it's, it's gone, but we got to use it in a different way. So exactly. Those are great. Um, Tiffany, this is your book growth IQ, and I cannot encourage enough people to go take a look at it. What are, um, if someone's listening and they want to get in touch with you, they're curious, they want to learn more. What are some ways that they can connect with you? Sure. I'm super active on social. So uh, follow me on LinkedIn and or Twitter or Instagram uh, or Facebook. Um, and I'm pretty active uh, on all the platforms. Um, and I have a podcast called What's Next with Tiffany Bova, where I get to interview a lot of those people I used to see on the road. <laughs> so, you know, we'd be backstage in the green room. I'd be like, hey, I've got a podcast. Would you like to join me? Sure, absolutely. Now I, you know, I have to reach out and they're like, who are you? What do you, what do you, what do you want to talk to me about? So, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, but the podcast is awesome. Uh, it's some fun conversations about all kinds of topics. It's really just what's next. Um, and so, you know, I'd love to hear from you. And if you read the book, uh, I'd love to hear what stood out. So, you know, always open to get feedback either way. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Tiffany Bova. You are the global growth and innovation evangelist at Salesforce found on the web at tiffanybova.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. 
Thanks for listening to the episode. If you like it, please subscribe, share this episode or this show with other people around you. The greatest form of a compliment is a referral. I really appreciate them. And if you think that you want to learn more about some of the work we're doing, I encourage you to reach out to katherinecanty.com. You can schedule a call or just continue to read articles and information that we post out there. Thank you so much for being here.